Today I'd like to go over each one of these questions individually. And again, this is over the beginner preparedness list. This is version two. And I'd like to go into more detail on each one of these on why I chose them for uh, where to start. Number one, how will I communicate with friends or loved ones if internet and cell phones go down? This is obviously it's obvious why you need to know this question, but one of the questions that follow this is if you have kids, who's gonna pick up the kids? If both of you work uh, in different areas of the city or uh, say someone commutes on a train uh, going into a city or going a distance away, who's gonna pick up the kids? If you have you know, toddlers or infants and they're at daycare, you really need to plan out um, how that works. And if you cannot communicate, say that's not an option, then you need to have a plan in place ahead of time of who is gonna pick up your children uh, or who is gonna go where. Say one of you um, lives at home or works at home and the other one works at a hospital or something. And the person that works at home might be closer to pick up the kids than the person that's in city looking in the city working at the hospital. And then also, how are you going to communicate with friends? You know, just to know what's going on. Are they safe? Was there like uh, something like a 9/11 attack where um, you know major buildings were um, attacked and collapsed, and you just need to know if they're safe? What's the plan in place for that? Um, if there's a hurricane that just came through or a major earthquake or say there's flooding like in Nebraska right now, then uh, how do you talk to them? How do you just make sure everyone's doing okay or, or to let them know, hey, we're here to help. We're here to get you out. We just don't know how to talk to you. So what's that, what's that protocol? Number two, are my important documents and images backed up and encrypted and an easy to transport option. Are these same items backed up in a remote location that is also secure? When I say uh, backed up in an easy to transport option, what I'm referring to for me personally are the, the uh, Apricorn um, little thumb drives and they have different sizes in there up to like 128 or something, but they require no software on the computer you're putting them on. They are on the hardware, they're, um, there's a keypad and you can put the keypad in on the thumb drives and uh, that way it's still encrypted and then you can have, excuse me, you can have it set up where uh, after 10 attempts it just wipes the data. And that gives you an option to carry your uh, bank account information, pictures of kids or loved ones in case there is a situation where everyone is separated and there is one of those walls or there is a website that goes up to find your loved ones that gives you something to say, you know, it's, um, you know, a five-year-old boy with brown hair. Well, that's not going to help anybody. So what do you do? And so you can give them a picture and say, this is who we're looking for. And they can say, oh, okay. And then on that same thing, have your you know social security numbers for everybody, passport numbers for everybody, credit card numbers to cancel in case you need to, uh, insurance information, all that kind of information, you know, uh, pictures of titles and deeds and all legal documents that might be important. And that way, if you do have to just grab and go, like I've discussed before, and having your evacuation bag, your bug out bag, that you just grab it and, and you can go. And you have pictures digitized of every, all your stuff that's in one spot. I recommend taking that thumb drive that's encrypted, putting it in a Ziploc, rolling the Ziploc tight, closing it, then taking that Ziploc, put it in another Ziploc facing in opposite directions. So that way your seams are opposite and then doing the same thing. That way you, uh, usually they're water resistant. Uh, there's a small O-ring, not waterproof. And again, Ziplocs aren't hundred percent, but having one is really good. I mean, you can take them rafting and they're, they're pretty durable. And then putting in a second one is definitely gonna enhance the reliability. 
And then the second part of that are these items backed up in a remote location that is also secure. In another video, I'm gonna go over Drobo and why we are choosing to use Drobo. But one of the benefits that they have is you can have one of their network connected drives at your house and everyone can share Time Machine if you're using uh, a Mac. You can have all your iTunes backed up to that same spot. All those items can be in that location and uh, all your pictures, everything that's important that's digital to you um, and everything you've scanned, taken pictures of, you know, important uh, items in your house, all that is backed up and then it's in a RAID configuration, which means if one or two drives fail, you still have all your data. And then the benefit of Drobo is that it's, it's super simplistic. It is extraordinarily easy to use, which is the reason I went with it instead of Synology or something. And um, you just put in drives and it's ready to go. But one of the benefits is if you have a, a second um, mirror image of the one at your house, you can put it at uh, you know, your family's location or somewhere else that has an internet and it'll do a mirror image. And you can set it to back up or to copy uh, however often you want. And that way, say your house gets broken into or there's a fire or a flood and you have to evacuate and you are grabbing your grab and go bag and that's all you've got. And say you don't update that thumb drive but every six months, that way your most current stuff is all on that Drobo and it's secure because you know, you're not on the cloud somewhere, which is an option, but you know you have to worry about security when you go in that too. Uh, but this way it's all yours and then you can go to uh, wherever that drive is you know and I recommend hours away or states away minimum uh, minimum hours away that way if there's a regional disaster you know like a flood or a fire or something hopefully that's not in the path of what's gone wrong and then you can also put a Kensington lock on it and you can take and wrap it around or you know put it in the wall in a stud. You can put it around a, a bookshelf, a metal bar or something. And that way it's um, less resistant to being just walked away with. The next item is, is our house secure from home invasion? And uh, that goes into a whole other chapter on on security and uh, home security and just security in general. Uh, the, what I would say to that is you need to talk about um, is our home secure from home invasion? Are your windows locked and are things situated in such a way that um, if someone were to try and break through that window, they either have a challenge going up into the window or they'd have a challenge when they went through the window, there's an obstacle or something in the way, like, you know, curtains or something. Um, you can go into the kind of the more extreme side uh, if things were to fall apart or if you just want to have a really secure house for some reason, you can actually take paracord and you can weave a net and uh, on each, side you can put those small little hooks and uh, just put the paracord net in front of your window and uh, if you know things are falling apart and people are breaking into some places if someone goes to knock out your window or break out your break out your window frame or something and try and pull it out or push in that net is only gonna move like an inch or so. So everything's just gonna go and stop. And that paracord is really strong. And while those little hooks are not very strong in themselves, if you have 20 or 30 of them all the way around, that does make a really strong thing. It's like ants, you know, one ant, uh, for this example, is not very strong, but if you put a bunch of ants together, then they can carry, you know, huge items for their size. And uh, secure for home invasion. Do you have um, a method during good times and bad, definitely, uh, to have a little motion sensor or something just outside your walkway so you know if someone's walking up? That way your first interaction if someone's walking up is not the doorbell ringing or, or a heart banging on the door. You have a couple of seconds to at least get your mind ready for, hey, someone's walking up. Uh, do you have a driveway sensor? If you live in an area where you do have a driveway and you can put it up that way, you know if someone drives up uh, and you at least, again, have that short period of time, but it gives you a second to, to just be a little more ready. Uh, do you have a way to, um, are, your, are your doors uh, 
strong enough where if someone is really beating on them with a baseball bat or sledgehammer or uh, kicking it really hard, they can take a couple of hits. It doesn't have to be a vault door, but something where you can, you know, metal door or really hard wood door where it's going to take a few of those hits and it's got a good deadbolt system in place where it's going to take them really good. Uh, and hinges too. All those screws need to be in. You know, you know, those little cheap screws that come with everything aren't going to do anybody any good. You can watch plenty of videos on YouTube about that. Get some big, you know, honking screws that are going to just really go into the stud and really anchor those hinges and the uh, deadbolt uh, strike plate and all that stuff in place. And then again, um, debate firearms however you want to but do you have a shotgun or something that's really good at short range that uh, if they do breach your perimeter of your house either that one person or multiple people that you do have a way in a high stress environment that you can uh, send round, rounds down range and not have to worry about being super accurate and um, do you know what's on the other side of that? You know, if you, um, if all you have is just sheetrock and tin metal on the outside, you know, buckshot's just going to stream right through that. So make sure you know where those bolts are going to go. Um, you know, if you shoot it, are you, is that going to go in your neighbor's house? Are you going to kill one of them? Make sure you really know what's on the other side of what you're aiming at. Uh, and maybe a shotgun's not right for you. Maybe a handgun is, is the right option. You know, go to a, um, some firearm experts and talk to them. Go some to some, to some um, security experts and talk to them and see what they recommend for your specific situation. And then number four, in the event of a fire, do we have a fire extinguisher? And do we know how to use it? Where do we meet if we have to evacuate the house? The fire extinguisher, everyone should have a fire extinguisher, at least one or two. Um, everyone should have a, at least a cheap fire extinguisher. You need to have an ABC, uh, and that's for the, the basics. That's uh, for wood, electrical, and um, like gasoline, like a, a gasoline type fire. Uh, know the basics of just how to put fire out. You know, if you're, um, if you are cooking on the stove and you're doing something with oil, like frying something, um, don't take your fire extinguisher and just spray it down at it because all you're going to do at that point, that oil is just bas is gasoline basically, and you're just going to take and just spray it and it's going to go all over your kitchen cabinets, all over you, uh, your kids if they're in there, dogs, anything that's in there that they can catch that flying burning liquid is going to get caught and burned. What you could do instead is just take a lid and just put it over the top of it. And then once that's there, you remove the fire, the oxygen. And, uh, you know, fire needs, um, there's a tetrahedron. You can Google that too, that's good to know. Uh, but basically, you put it on there, it takes the oxygen away, and uh, then the fire's not there anymore. Um, then, how to use a fire extinguisher. There's an acronym called PASS, pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. And uh, you, it's self-explanatory. So you're holding a fire extinguisher, you pull the pin. They all have some form, plastic or metal. So pull the pin, aim, aim just like a gun where you want it to go. Squeeze, you're gonna squeeze the handle. It's either a plastic one built on or a metal one and you're gonna squeeze it and it's gonna, depending on the, the function of it, it's gonna make the stuff come out, whether it's water or uh, foam or dry chem, dry chemical or whatever it's gonna be. And then, uh, then sweep. So you're gonna take it either with the extinguisher has no hose on it, so you just wanna be really gentle where you're going, or with a hose, and you wanna sweep at the base of the fire. You don't, if the fire's burning here, say this iPad was the bottom of the fire, but there's fire up here on your wall, uh, and it's just like licking the ceiling or something, you don't wanna spray up here, because unless it rains down on it, it's not gonna do anybody any good. You wanna aim where the fire is, the base of it. And, um, even though it'll be stressful, just remember, just take a deep breath and um, just do little bursts. So it's just like, a, just like a gun. You don't want to just spray and pray. You know, put a couple of uh, little spots down and then the, is, what you do, is what you're doing working? Or is it making it worse? What's going on? Um, and, you know, work on that critical thinking in stressful situations. And again, that's why I think going to the range and practicing is really good because 
training with someone, you know, yell at you or music or, you know, shooting next to you or whatever it is, uh, that helps your brain think, you know, do you shoot? Anyway, that's a whole other topic. Just work on critical thinking in stressful situations. Then uh, where do we go? Where do we meet if we have to evacuate the house? Usually this can be, uh, you know, you're going to go across the street to your neighbor's house there. They might have a big tree and everyone knows we're going to go to that big tree across the street and we're going to stay in there. Don't go anywhere else. We're going to go to the tree. Uh, or you can say, okay, you know, maybe we live in a rough area and, um, you know, you're going to go down two houses to, to someone you know um, and make sure they know that if you're in that rough part of town that that's that in the future if something like that happens that's what you're going to do and they're welcome to come to your house and stay there if they need to if you're in, a, in, in an apartment building this would be evacuating um, not to an apartment over or something, but like leaving the building and going, uh, usually you can talk to the apartment complex. They usually have a designated area like in the parking lot across, um, across the parking lot for everyone to stage because uh, you don't know how that fire is going to move because you just don't know. Then number five, who will get the kids in an emergency and bring them home if cell phones do not work? This tags back into number one, I think. I think it was number one. Yeah, number one. And uh, this is just a conversation, to hap conversation that needs to happen of what are you going to do if you can't talk on the cell phone and uh, internet's down so you can't like Facebook message or anything? How are you going to talk? And uh, this is not, you know, far out reaching. I mean, it is entirely possible at some point in, uh, in our lifetime for a, um, for a hacker to intentionally bring down the cell phone network. And uh, there's a whole other conversation that can happen, you know, with, um, for safety that it can come down for certain situations, but let's just stick to if, <laughs> sorry, if, uh, if hackers get into it. And, um, and then how are you gonna communicate with each other? And if you cannot, one option uh, that you can look into is you can get your GMRS license. And in most big cities um, and even rural areas at this point, uh, a radio club or somebody has put up a GMRS repeater. And then the way basics of how that works is you talk on your radio. It's going to go to this uh, antenna that's usually on a tall building or, or a tower or something. And then it'll amplify your signal and then go out to a bigger area. So say normally you keep your radio and you can only go three or four miles. Well, with a repeater, within range of it, you can actually go 30 or 40, maybe even 50 miles. And if cell phones go down, that's an option to consider. That takes a lot more effort and there are other videos that can cover that really well. Uh, comms preppers and a lot of stuff on that. But that's something to consider is that if cell phones go down, just have a radio in place. And yes, you're not going to talk, you know, across the state, um, but well, you, I guess you could in small states, but you know, if you're in Dallas or something, you could at least talk, um, or say you're in, um, where's the, where's the example? California has a bunch of repeaters set up so you can talk from, you know, the, the coast to the desert and stuff like that. And uh, it's just important to have, have communication plans in place or just have a plan that if they go down, you're not going to communicate. Uh, you know, the husband is going to go and get the kids and the wife is going to go home and start getting the bag journey. And, you know, you'll have a set items of uh, what, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean if, say, you know, riots are going on, but they're on the north half of the city and they're not terrible you know they're not they're not burning down buildings yet they're just kind of blocking traffic which is still a whole topic in itself um, or have you had you know a, a v-bit a vehicle born ied go off and uh in the city you know is that your cue to just go and evacuate and uh see how things are going outside of town and those are number one through five. I'm going to make another video on six through, uh, probably six through 15. I can knock some of those out pretty quick. And um, then I'll go over on the where to start one through seven. Oh, this is helpful. It, it's my goal that uh, 
that I put out as much information and try and direct you to as many avenues as possible. Uh, even if it's not my content, but just get you to places that can give you information. And um, it's really important to know this stuff because you have things like Venezuela, you have the, the very bad riots in France, you have the flooding in Nebraska, and that's just this week. That's not even, I mean, and that's been going on for a while, but I mean, you can just look at just this week alone, and uh, there's countless other stuff that's going on. You have the fires that were in Houston and the chemical plant, and I mean, those are making the air bad to breathe. I mean, that's definitely a reason to pack up and leave for a couple of days. You know, I mean, you, need, you don't need to be in that environment if you have the ability to not be there. Um, so, I mean, that's just the last seven days. So it is very important to know this kind of stuff.